Hey, it's Brian, and I'm back with another one of these Burr Months bonus episodes. As we ease our way into the 2019 Christmas season, I wanted to get an early start and keep in touch and hopefully make your Burr Months a little more merry and bright. The regular season of Christmas Pass begins on Thanksgiving Day, and these Burr Month bonuses are pretty freeform. I'm going to use the opportunity to introduce you to some content and voices that maybe you wouldn't have come across on your own. We'll have some more guest episodes and maybe some Q&As. I was even planning on reading some short stories for you. If you have any ideas or requests, get in touch through Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, or through the contact page at christmaspass.media. Now before we move on, let me remind you about ChristmasCon on November 8th, 9th, and 10th in Edison, New Jersey. My new friends at That's For Entertainment have put together a first-of-its-kind convention. You can see and even get an autograph from the stars of your favorite Christmas movies. People like Lacey Chabert, Alicia Witt, and Aaron Krakow. And I'll be there too. Not that I'll be signing autographs, although I'm happy to give you one if you like. But I'll be participating on a Q&A panel of Christmas creators on the 9th. I'd love to see you there. Stay tuned on social media for more details as they become available. And you'll also want to go to thatsforentertainment.com. That's that's, the number four, entertainment.com. It's where you can get all the details and, more importantly, where you can get tickets before they're all gone. Now, where would Christmas be without stories? Every year we return to our favorite books and movies and TV specials and also look forward to new ones. Kind of helps explain why Hallmark and Lifetime have dozens queued up for the season. Well, if you've listened to this show long enough, you'll know what a fan of audio fiction I am. I even did an episode in Season 1 about the lost Christmas classics from the Golden Age of Radio. So it's my privilege to introduce you to a new Christmas story written by Kyle Bullock. It's available in print, too, but this is a podcast, so, you know. It's called Mr. Christmas. Here's the setup. With the holidays just weeks away, Ryan finds himself alone in a bar, nursing the Christmas blues. That's when a mysterious stranger by the name of Nick offers him a job help him create a real-life Santa. I asked Kyle how the idea for this story came about. Really, this book was written with the intent of just being a gift to my wife. My wife is such a Christmas fanatic that I really wanted to give her something special that she could enjoy year-round and still appreciate Christmas. We wanted to create an audiobook experience because a lot of our friends are either performers or voice actors of some kind, and we love working on projects with them. So. The idea was kind of birthed that we can create this narrative, this story, in audiobook form with all of our friends. And it was kind of our way of bringing our community together. It ended up being just a lot of fun. I got to work with my, my best friends and people who I care very much about. And uh, we got to talk about Christmas all year round. In this bonus episode, I'm going to share with you the first two chapters of the audiobook. It's an extended sample available only to Christmas Past listeners. And if you like what you hear and want to listen to the rest, Kyle is offering something else just to Christmas Past listeners. You can have the whole audiobook for three bucks. Three bucks! There's no strings, there's no catch. Just use the promo code GIFT at checkout when you go to mrchristmasbook.com. Now, I'll be back again at the end, but for now, here's an extended preview of Mr. Christmas. Mr. Christmas by Kyle R. Bullock for Devin, my Mrs. Christmas. Chapter One. This is a story of how a crazy old guy who thought he was Santa Claus changed my life forever. As a heads up, this story will not contain flying reindeer or elves or any of that magical nonsense. There is nothing mystical about this guy or this story or any of its characters, so don't get the impression that I'm about to tell you something crazy or ridiculous. In fact, let me just give away the ending right now. Everyone comes to their senses and realizes this guy isn't Santa Claus and that he didn't come with reindeer or elves or any of that. Okay, that was my disclaimer. I feel like I can go on now. My name is Ryan, and if you can't tell... I've been a bit jaded and cynical about the whole Christmas thing and my life in general. And that's changing for me. I'm working on some uh, personal stuff right now, and that's due in large part to Nick, but I'll get to that later. First, let's talk about me. I'm a bit of a jerk. 
I didn't used to be this way. I used to be a real nice stand-up guy. I was a grade A student growing up and a member of the church choir. My wife, rather, my ex-wife and I were very popular amongst our peers. We got invited to all the Christmas parties and functions. We had picturesque Christmas cards that we mailed out every year, the kind where we hired a professional photographer to make us look younger and slimmer than we actually were. This is going on the fridge of everyone we know for at least the next six weeks, she would say. Please try to make your smile look real. I wasn't the biggest fan of Christmas, if you didn't already guess. She sometimes had a drag to cheer right out of me. But still, to my point, she was the best thing that ever happened in my life. Then I went and threw it all away on a whim. Well, it wasn't a whim. It was more of a growing dissatisfaction with my life and myself. My spiral started small and it went crazy big. What started as me wanting more me time ended up in an affair and a divorce within a year's time. Oh, and to add to my royal mistake, it was an affair with someone in my office, someone higher up and more valuable than me. So I got fired promptly, which was just great. I then spent the next 43 days looking for work at any neighboring firm that would give me the time of day. In all, I went to seven job interviews, and I got told no eight times, which should qualify as some sort of record if they give those out to losers like me. The last guy who tossed me out was very droll and annoyed that I was back in his office begging for a job. Mr. Connor, your resume looks right, but your references... About that, I I, I can explain, I started. It's not something we feel will mesh with our culture here. I I, I can mesh, I promise. I'm like a chameleon. I'll blend in. You won't even notice me. Once again, we aren't interested. Oh, come on, please. The guy looked past me to his assistant who sat in the corner. Can we get him out of here? And that is what led me to sitting in a bar down the street for my latest interview on September 27th, drinking my third beer at four in the afternoon. I had just received my eighth no and I wanted to be anywhere but my dingy apartment. The tie around my neck hung loose and low, ripped from my collar like my hope for this job. An old friend of mine, Laura, she owned the bar, and she didn't mind me sulking with my beverage at the front. It was a small bar, tucked away in between a couple of crummy office buildings a few blocks from downtown. The beer was cheap, and the company wasn't neat, which served my purpose as well. Laura kept herself busy at the bar, taking inventory, and occasionally peered over her readers to give me a hint of pity. I I didn't care. I didn't even pay attention to her, nor the gentleman who walked into the otherwise empty bar and headed straight for the counter. Laura and this guy talked in a tone too low to eavesdrop. She looked confused and glanced over at me and then nodded her head to the man. The guy shook hands and marched cheerfully over to my booth at the front. He appeared to be in his late 50s, uh, early 60s, with a dark complexion. He had the classic friar tuck old ball guy thing going for him and a short, well-maintained beard. What hair he had was speckled with bits of white. His smile was kind and comforting and his eyes were small, round, and bright hazel in color. He had a pooch for a stomach, but he wasn't fat. He was dressed in khakis, a red button-up shirt with a tan jacket draped over his meager frame. Hi. Are you Ryan Connors? Call me Nick, he said, extending his hand out to me eagerly. Uh, hello? I know this might seem a bit out of the blue and all, but I would like to offer you a job. I perked up at this. Sure, he was a total stranger approaching me, a washed-up, white-collar loser, with a job offer for who knows what. But money is money, and money was scarce. So I said... You want to offer me a job? I do. He sat down across from me, uninvited, I might add. He still had a glowing, warm smile beaming across his face. Your temp agency told me about you, and I had to talk to you first thing. They told me they had sent you to a firm downtown. So I went there, and you had already left, they said. Uh, but, but the door guy said he saw you head into here. I hope I didn't catch you at a bad time. I, uh, I've seen better days. 
You want me for a job? Yes, I think you'll be very suited for it. What, uh, what job? Nick coughed and politely covered his mouth and sat up at attention. He reached into his jacket pocket and pulled out a manila envelope. He fiddled with the catch of the envelope as he spoke. You were in finance, yes? A degree in business management, I'm told? Yeah, seven years at my last job. Started there after college. I need someone to manage my factory for the next three months. It's only a temporary position, but it will compensate you well, and it will be rewarding work, I promise. At this point, Laura leaned on the counter, drawing a little closer to us so she could overhear. I didn't mind. Nick went on. I just got here. Drove up two weeks ago from Texas. I knew this is where I wanted to start my business from the word go. Already have a warehouse, parts and tools are on order and are being delivered any day now. We can be up and going by the end of the first week of October, which is good because we have a lot of work to do. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, I must have missed it, uh, Nick. What are we making? Toys. <laughs> Classic toys. That's my specialty. Not the things that link up with phones and computers and all that. I do handcrafted toys for little kids all the way to adults. Of course, Christmas will be here in a few weeks, and we are right in time to get things out by then. Uh, how big is your company? How many people? Right now? You and me, provided you accept my offer. You mean you want to start a handcrafted toy company, and you don't have any hands to make them? You have no one to make toys? Not yet. That's where you come in. I want you to help me hire, manage, and produce handcrafted toys in time for Christmas deliveries. Uh, okay, well, what do your orders look like? <laughs> My orders? Yeah, what stores are buying them? What quantities? What's the delivery like on them? Oh, oh, I see. I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand at first. I, I don't have any orders. At this, Laura stood straight up at the bar and gave her full attention to our conversation. I slid my drink to the side of the table and leaned forward in my seat incredulously. <laughs> you have no employees, no orders. You just got tools in a warehouse, and you want to make toys for Christmas with no orders. He just nodded. Then what exactly are you doing, I asked. He chuckled and patted his stomach happily, coughing intermittently. He looked over to Laura as if to include her in a conversation. Why, I'm making toys for Christmas. For the kids on Christmas Eve. That is when it hit me like a ton of bricks. The only job offer made to me in over a month and a half, the only glimmer of hope, was with a crazy person. I think Laura put the pieces together at the same time and we both looked at each other and back at this man. Very funny, I said to him. Toys for Christmas? Your name is Nick. My, my God, you're wearing a red shirt. This is hilarious. Very funny. You know, I actually had a little hope for a second, but you know what? Thanks for dashing them to pieces again. Two times in one day. I think that's pretty great. I took another swig of my drink and leaned back in my chair. No, oh, it's not a joke. I'm quite serious about this. He was stroking his beard. This really annoyed me. If anything, he was committed to the part. Look, you want to play Santa Claus? Go ring a bell for charity, but please leave me alone. But I told you I would pay you handsomely. I said, leave me alone. Nick opened the manila envelope and slid it across the table. Stuffed inside, I could see the ends of $100 bills. I will pay you $5,000 a month for the next three months. That is a $1,000 signing bonus in cash. All yours, no strings attached, if you say yes. <laughs> and if you come to the warehouse and don't like it, <clears throat> you can quit any time. No harm and no foul. It had been a long time since I had seen a $100 bill. It had also been a long time since I had felt wanted for anything. I looked over to Laura, who just stood there as dumbfounded as I was. Give me a chance to show you the warehouse and what we'll be doing, please. You seriously want to play Santa Claus? For real? Well, if not me, then who? He promptly got up with his manila envelope, scribbled an address down on a nearby napkin, 
and glided out the door with a pep in his step. What do you think? I asked Laura. She just laughed. A thousand bucks for a tour of a metal building? That'll buy you a lot of beer around here. Well, she had a point. Chapter 2 I showed up to the warehouse located in a pretty unsavory part of town. The neighborhood was not well maintained or cared for. It was the kind of place that police cruisers patrol every hour. The warehouse itself, it was tucked back behind a chain link fence. The entry gate was wide open. Weeds were poking through the cracks in the asphalt, and a real estate sign hung out front reading, Under Contract. I felt pretty out of place. I dressed up in a button-up, slacks, and a light jacket. I don't know why, it was clearly not the kind of place for smart business dress. Maybe I was still insecure about being out of work, and I really needed the money. Anyways, I walked through the door of the warehouse and discovered, to my surprise, that a lot of love had been given to the inside. The main floor was outfitted with a long assembly line tables, and the floor itself was swept squeaky clean. Boxes of supplies lined the walls, wood, paint, nails, screws, that kind of thing. Towards the back, on the second level, was a manager's office with a great big window that peered out over the production floor. The blinds were drawn back, revealing an empty office. I was expecting to see Nick somewhere in there, but I should have known better. Underneath the office, in stacks of boxes, I heard grunting and shuffling. Nick was unpacking supplies and taking inventory with a battered old clipboard. He must have heard me shuffle in because he stopped and bounded toward me with surprising joy in his step. Ryan Connors, you made it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad you're on board. I reassured him I was just sniffing things out, but honestly, I was desperate for the money. I was actually just relieved to see he wasn't smuggling drugs or wild animals through his business. I didn't need that kind of stress. Nick patted my back and led me around the floor, showing me the assembly line where the workers would put together the products. He showed me the concept art and the blueprints for different toy designs that we'd be creating, and he showed me where I would be officing, in the second floor manager suite. So what do you want me to be doing, exactly? I asked. He gave me a stack of bills that needed paying in a ledger. I was to be the financial manager and bookkeeper and all things administrative. And uh, what will you be doing? I asked. He smiled and responded simply, Making toys. Of course, he had no intention of making all the toys himself. He would create, design, and have a hand in quality control of the product. To do it right, we would need a workforce to pull their weight, which is where things get a little hairy. Nick hadn't exactly come to town with a herd of elves to do his work. Is it a herd of elves? Is it a pack of elves? A gaggle? I don't, I don't know. Anyways, it doesn't matter. Simply put, there was a lot of work to be done and no one to do it. I'm looking at your workload here, Nick, and I'm guessing you'll need a dozen or so hired hands to get it done in time. I mean, This is a great time of year to get seasonal help, but we need to have a workforce ready to go like yesterday. I'm glad you brought that up. I'm already ahead of you on it. I went door to door in the neighborhood and handed out help wanted invitations. Help wanted invitations? Yes, yes, I wanted the neighborhood to feel a part of this project. I've already budgeted salaries and compensation, a general handbook, and, well, here's what I've put together. He handed me a packet with numbers and data and spreadsheets. Nick, no offense, but this neighborhood isn't exactly, well, I'm not sure you're going to get the caliber of people you want working here. Nick looked confused at me. Well, what kind of caliber do you think I need? I think you'd want people that you can trust and who will show up on time. I mean, people who you can, you know, count on. I can't count on these people? Look, Nick, I'll be blunt. I don't think you'll want people working for you who probably you know, shoot up drugs on the weekend and don't want to work in the first place. Besides, I'd be surprised if any of them show up for an interview. I mean, we're not talking about the cream of the crop here, man. Nick gave me a forced half-smile and scratched his belly, kindly looking past me and my insensitivity to the four candidates who had just walked through the door behind me. I turned around, seeing their beat-down faces staring back at me quietly. 
I mean, no telling how long they had been there or how much they had heard. I just wanted to throw up, but I decided I had disgusted them enough. <clears throat> Ryan, I think your candidates are ready to be interviewed. As Nick said this, another young man came in through the main entrance and got in line. I nodded, took their names, and waved the first one into my new office upstairs, and felt as small as a bug on a rug. I'll skip right to it. In all that day, I interviewed 12 people. 13 if you count a young man who was so desperate for a job that he came back an hour later to see if I had made a decision. Come on, sir. I'll start today. Seriously, I'm ready. He said anxiously. I, I know, kid, but give me the night to think on it and- Seriously, sir, I'm ready to start. I need a job so my mom can stop griping at me. Please, man. I hired him first, right there on the spot, in part just to get him to leave me alone, but it felt right. His name was Trey. He was 17. He always came to work dressed in baggy shorts or jeans and his sports jersey hanging loosely around his thin frame. He talked a lot, and it took him a while to get some of the toys out right, but he stayed late, and he worked hard to learn. He was also always first to get his paycheck. It was probably the first honest paycheck in his life. As for hiring the rest, I took the night to sleep on it. We would need more help, and all the help we could get, but I didn't want to make a snap judgment and regret it. Of the 12 people who showed up that first day, I hired 11 to work in the assembly line on the floor. The twelfth guy was not all there to begin with. He came in dressed in a dirty, worn clothing, reeking of body odor. You could tell he wasn't all there either. No, Nick, we can't hire him, I said. I could tell he wanted to. Nick had that jolly look in his eye. Why on earth can't we? Nick, he's a liability. What do you mean, a liability? We can't trust him. I mean, what if he freaks out on us? He could cause damage or, I don't know, hurt somebody. I mean, what if he... And what if he is an angel in disguise? Or a descendant of royalty? What if he wants to give you a million dollars? What if he is really crazy? What if, what if, what if, what if stopped the greatest men and women in the world from entering the history books because they sat on their hands, petrified? Here is a noble thought. What if we could make a jolly fat man in a red suit real for some people this year? Wouldn't that be something? He said all this with the most annoyingly pleasant smile, and he patted me on the back as he left the room. I sighed and rolled my eyes. I ended up giving Harry a few bucks to let him mop the floors and sweep the offices an hour every day. Truth be told, he was fine. He mostly kept to himself and he mumbled a lot, but he wouldn't hurt a fly. And I suppose having him keep the floor clean inside a warm building was better than having him on the cold streets. As for the others I hired, I can't remember all their names. I can, however, remember all of their faces. There were a few that stuck out. There was Harriet. She was in her early 30s, single mother of two. She was always the first to the door each morning, sometimes before even I got there. She came right after she had dropped her kids off at school and left as soon as she could to pick them up. Harriet had the steadfast determination about her that actually intimidated me, to be honest. Like, she would walk a thousand miles over a hot asphalt to make sure that she and her kids were taken care of. She was a great worker, always put out the best toys. And I can't forget about Dwayne. He was a tall, dark, serious man in his late 50s. He was thin, often wore an old, tired polo tucked into tattered pants, and he had a thick black mustache. You could tell he had really had some pain in his life. You could just see it from the look in his eyes. I rarely heard him say more than a few words each day. Wanda and Casey were our resident peanut gallery, a couple of feisty 70-year-olds who came in a package deal, even insisted on being interviewed together. I remember watching them talk over each other in the interview, and Wanda kicked it off. Casey and I have been friends forever. Forever. When we saw the flyer for this job opening, we just had to do it. We've got gifts to buy for the grandkids. Yes, and Social Security hardly pays the bills. Oh, please. I couldn't feed a fat tick on what they give me. Casey, now let's not go there right now. Why not, Wanda? This young man should know. Ain't nothing good come out of the government, and I ain't afraid to say it, no matter what the young man's political inclinations are. 
They are all a load of airheads. Now, Casey, you might be right, but don't go digging a hole for yourself before we even start working. They went on like that for 15 minutes. All I said was, hello, sit down. Beyond these colorful characters was a rotating menagerie of faces. We fired a few people who would steal things, I mean, little things like cleaning supplies or baubles from the line. After they got sacked, Nick insisted on getting their address and going to their house afterward with a care package of food and cleaning supplies. He never stopped me from firing anyone, and there weren't that many, but I could tell it crushed him. A few faces left on their own. A couple just didn't show up to work, and others just got tired of the work, I guess, and just walked off the line. Nick never enforced a dress code, and he never kept track of hours. He let the workers come in and go as they needed, which drove me bonkers trying to keep up with the timesheets and the payroll. He greeted everyone each morning with a big box of donuts or cup of coffee and a bright smile. Then he would jump on the line and start showing the group which toy they were making and how to do it. In the afternoon, he would pop his head into my office door and ask, How's that Christmas spirit, Ryan? Fine, I'd tell him, and I'd dig my head back into my desk. He would then motion to the office window that looked out over the floor and say, Don't forget to look out every once in a while and remember there's life on the other side. I would nod and give him a forced smile. This interaction was pretty regular in the beginning until eventually I just had to ask him, What's your game here, Nick? Huh? <laughs> he stammered out a deep, heavy cough. I could tell it hurt, but I continued anyways. The Santa act is real cute, making all these toys for people, but the money's going to run out, and it's clear that you're not worried about that. <laughs> I wish I had this much money to blow. From what I can tell, you'll be broke by the end of the year, and you're clearly not worried. So, what is your game here, Nick? Why are we really doing this? No one is this benevolent. He just smiled and stared out towards the workers on the floor, busy in their toy making. There's life out there, Ryan. <coughs> oh, don't ever forget that. <laughs> well, get that cough looked at, I shouted as he scurried off to his little elves downstairs. Nick was a good man. I admired his heart. Unfortunately, for the city government and a number of very irate business owners, a good heart wasn't enough to run a business at Christmas. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Again, go to mrchristmasbook.com and use promo code GIFT at checkout to get the whole thing for three bucks. And don't forget to go to that'sforentertainment.com to get your tickets to Christmas Con. Christmas Past is produced in sunny San Mateo, California by yours truly, Brian Earl. Keep in touch on Twitter, Instagram, and in the Christmas Past Facebook group so that we can make the rest of the Burr months merry and bright together. And I'll see you again very soon.